Hey, William, Rabbi, you got me Mitchell Lofsky from West Hempstead. <clears throat> Very good. Welcome to the uh, show. Hi. This is my question. There's a story that Jesus goes to Yerushalayim, and people are waving who love him and saying Hoshanas, and the crowds love him. Then, later on, the crowd turns on him. Is it possible this is two different stories, that Jesus went there during circus time, and then he went again on Pesach, and that would explain why the crowd was different? No. Jesus' grand entry into Jerusalem, and in fact, that's how it's referred. It's called. Everybody, should I hang up or go and let Yeah, him yeah, sure do. Thank okay, you. let's go ahead and disconnect, and we'll open the phone lines. Thank you. Tune in for your answer. This is a, a motif we find in the Christian Bible everywhere. It traces itself back to the earliest gospel that survives, Mark. And that is two competing ideas about Jesus. One is that Jesus was rejected. And in fact, let's just take Mark. It's the most interesting gospel, in my opinion. So you have Mark, which the first eight chapters, nobody knows who Jesus is. That's what I find very curious about Mark. Now, I'm not here to give lectures on Mark. What is very curious about Mark is nobody knows who Jesus is, what he's supposed to do. His family thinks he's out of his mind. They want nothing. Nobody wants anything to do with him. And no one knows who he is. None of his disciples know who he is. Nobody gets it. Nobody gets it, except for spirits get it. But nobody else gets it. That's the curious thing about Mark. Now, later, more improved Gospels are going to tweak this. Mark begins with the Incipit. Jesus is the Son of God. That Incipit is the key. I mean, you should know, the reader should know, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay? This is the Gospel. And it interestingly ends with the centurion, is the Roman commander, represents the Goyim, by the cross, and the Goyim get that Jesus is truly the Son of God. The centurion at the cross. Got it? So, Mark theme, one huge theme, overarching theme, you don't get this, you don't get Mark is, that nobody knows who Jesus is. Nobody gets it, and, they're not, and whoever does finally figure out, don't say. Secret. Now, how would this develop? It's not hard to figure out. So no one, in fact, do this. This is later development. They had to explain why this is unknown. So what we find in Mark is that nobody gets Jesus. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus' inner circle, the less like it is you find anyone that got him. His family didn't know. You think his mother would know something because, after all, she had a conversation with the angel in Luke. Apparently, the, her conception of Jesus, not having been to bed with a man, did not impress her. The family thought he was out of his mind, even though Joseph got a lot of information, but the family was a big secret. You see, none of the stories fit together. Shakranim have to be very intelligent. And the creators of Christianity were not. They were very creative, but not. They let this stuff get through. So, the theme in Mark, and Mark is so important because Luke, even more than Matthew, both Luke and Matthew both take up almost the entire book of Mark and copy it over Luke even more so than Matthew. So, this is a driving theme. And we continue on. He came to his own, but he received a nut. Okay? One thing is that nobody knows who this guy is. Until the very end, nobody knows. They don't even know who, what he is. Who do you say that I am? And nobody knows. Peter says, you're the Christ. And, and we have the famous passage for those who went to Yeshiva, elevation of, of Peter. But even Peter is denying Jesus. Conversely, conversely, Jesus is also the one who everybody loves. And every, you can't even get in to see Jesus. Jesus is so busy healing people, there's crowds that they're building around, you can't get near him. We have the story of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, who is healed by Jesus. Again, nobody knows who he is, but there's such crowds in the house, they can't even get into the house. You have to, they have to take the, the, the person that they drop, take the sick person, drop them through the ceiling to get in, because there's such a crowd. Imagine a house, a house there on the street. And there's such a crowd there that you can't even get near the house. There's thousands of people around the house. And you can't even get in. You have to take them by a ladder, drop them down from this roof. So you have both themes going on. And you have it from beginning to the end. 
Nobody knows. From the very beginning, even you go to Matthew, it's a similar theme. Joseph thought that Mary had been unfair, loyal to him. How little did he know? He needed an angel. Luke, no room at the end. Luke has a very different infancy narrative. But Luke, Jesus was born in a, in a place that horses eat, in a manger, in a barn. Why? He wasn't even at the Holiday Inn, let alone the Marriott, or let alone the Four Seasons. He was because Luke has the family come from Nazareth rather than Bethlehem as Matthew. Matthew is no barn, there's no Holiday Inn because that's where the family's from. Too backward, no one gets it. So the key for the church is that we have Jesus do everything. He's everything you want him to be. On one hand, he's grand coming in Jerusalem and people are waving love him. No, that, that's happening right before the crucifixion. It's just all conflated, all conflated. I'll never forget, I don't think I ever told the story. Years, years ago, I don't remember how many years ago, I was in some sort of chat room, a Jews for Jesus type of chat room. I think it was on America Online. They used to have a chat room. So they had a, um, a chat room with missionaries, and I came in. Of course, when I came into the chat room, whatever, it was a whole thing, don't ask. So I asked in the chat room, what would happen if Passover would come out on Sukkot? What would happen? Well, they, would you have to have a, conduct a Passover Seder in a Sukkot? And actually, the debate, I just watched the back and forth, and there was a big debate broke out among missionaries. What would you do? This is, of course, impossible. How could the, the 15th day of the seventh month come out on the 15th day of the first month? You see, to them, it really, this was a question. What happens if Passover happens to come out on Sukkot? Because they know that Passover could come out on Tuesday, and it could come out on, I don't know, on April Fool's Day. See, I don't see what day does Passover come out on? It can't come out on Sukkot. It can't. It can't do it. Why? Because one is the 15th day of the seventh month. One is the 15th day of the, of the first month. They can't be. But because they know that's... I'm showing you where this comes from. But to the... You... I, I wouldn't... I did this. I just wanted to bring out this point. And then I brought out the point that to the people are not thinking they're stupid. That's not... They're not stupid. They're not idiots. Not at all. God forbid. It just, to them, it's all just Hoshana, wave the lulav, Passover, the feasts, and it's like you're in you're Sedona, Arizona, on, in, with red rocks everywhere and a stream of water coming in with the central vortex of Hoshana in Lord Most High, let's do a Davidic dance. <laughs> I'm not making fun, it's really how it goes. It really is, because they, they, nebuch, nebuch, nebuch. We, the Jews, failed them. We should have done more. We should have helped them more. And I'm sorry we didn't. So, in the Christian Bible, you have this tension. But they both work. Whatever you want. You want a hero, you want a heroine, you want a villain. We deliver it all. It's, the stories are, the characters are so well developed. And we can relate to Jesus, because I know what it's like not to be wanted. I know what it's like when someone threw me out of their house and didn't like me, didn't want me. I can relate to Jesus. But I would sure like to be like Jesus, where everyone just crowding and want to be near Jesus. I want to anoint him with oil. But no one gets it. You know who Mark gets it? You know, it's the woman who anoints Jesus' head, you know? And people are going, what are you doing with, with, with precious? She gets it. She's like this unknown, mysterious figure. She gets it, how precious Jesus is. But no one else does. You imagine that? If you were ever a Christian, you and I make this up. She's so beautiful in her. She just wants to be near Jesus. She wants us to be close to him. She recognizes. But she's this unknown personality from nowhere. Suddenly she just appears. And she understands it. This troubled girl. And she anoints Jesus' hair with very, very, very expensive perfume. And the other hand, nobody gets it. This is where Paul gets the in Christ thing. You know, the term in Christ? So you never have that in the Gospels, but you have that in Paul's writings. When a person's a Christian, it means you're in Christ. It means you go through the travails of Christ 
but you then are raised up in Christ and you go into paradise in Christ that's so pagan and drink his blood, eat his body in reverse, and then you subsume Christ and Christ then dwells in you and then you're dead to the old, you're alive to the new. Everything, everything I am saying to a person who's Jewish now watching the show is going, what? And to a Christian, like, oh my gosh. Because what's happening is that this is so attractive. Oh, nobody gets me. Nobody ever really appreciated me. But Jesus gets me, and I get Jesus, and I'm not going to reject him. I'm not going to do to him what the Jews did. It doesn't make a difference what the facts are. People will choose the sense of certainty and comfort over truth. Christ dwells in you. That's what this is all about. Did you notice that there's nothing in Tanakh about being in the Messiah? Nothing. Nothing remotely resembling such a idea. Nothing. Eating his body and drinking his blood? That's why you can have Sukkot, that means the Festival of Tabernacles, and the Festival of Passover. It's all conflated. They will love him. It's all together. It doesn't make a difference. You can have the opening of Mark, where Jesus is not known, not understood, rejected by his own, his own family, standing without, not what he, thinking he's out of his mind. Imagine that. And why would his own brethren, his own family, doesn't know who he is and what they do, and thinks he's out of his mind? And the Lord, the outer group, gets it. That's a, also a picture of the Jews and the Gentiles, meaning that the Jews are his own people, but they received him not. But the Goyim, the Gentiles, get it. It's that same theme. And that goes to Romans, to Paul, that the age of the Gentiles with the, with the grafted in and the natural branches are, are taken away. And so that's why you have the conflict. Don't confuse me with what Sukkot is and Pesach is and, and what it's not. It's not. It's oh, Jesus is in me, uh, in Christ, in Christ. The term in Christ, I'm not sure about this number. I'll bet it's somewhere around there. The term in Christ, in Paul's undisputed letters, I mean the seven indisputed epistles, the term in Christ probably appears 50 times, about there. I'm not off by much. That term is nowhere found in the gospel. That's such a appalling idea. Paul, Paul really, what he did to bring this, these, these ideas to the world, he brought such wickedness to the world, such idolatry to the world. He fused this, these pagan Greek ideas, and he fused it into a, a Jewish framework, and he drove it in. And it, this is why it takes Christians so long to recover from this. We go to Mark, and we have that tension. It goes throughout. The tension is from one end to the other. Jesus hated and loved. He is reviled and revered at the same time. And if you're in Christ, then although you're reviled by your own, you'll be revered, and you'll ultimately be in Christ, be raised up. Because who is he? He's my Passover. He's my tabernacle. He's my feast. He's my everything. He's my shover. My blood is my body. Hashem is calling out to you. This is the time to do tshuva. Time to repent. All the information is here. In the Ein Oid Hashem, there is no other God. For Ephes Komeni, there is no one like me. Isaiah 46, verse 9. Turn back, ye nations. Return to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let us see the coming of the true light. And the nation will arise. Arise, get up, for your light has come. Let's hope that we see this quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. <laughs> בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו אם לא כנועה והוא היה והוא